when I when Donna and I, my wife and I, drove into the Valley of the Sun, we live in Tucson, south of Tucson in Green Valley. But when we drove in yesterday, I couldn't help but thinking about 46 years ago when we moved to the Valley of the Sun from San Diego. I was serving as a pastor in Pacific Beach, and the bishop appointed me to Scottsdale uh, as an associate pastor on the church on, on, uh, on Miller Road. And um, of course, 46 years ago, the valley looked a little different than it did does today, doesn't it? And uh, this area particularly, I'm just stunned walking around last night a little bit and around the university to see all the, all the buildings that have gone up, the incredible structures that have uh, come up in the last uh, 20 years or more. So we don't get up to Phoenix very often. Um, but again, that memory of 46 years ago um, is really in my brain as I think about it. And the pastors at that time were Dorsey Allen and Jane Twos. And was anybody here, uh, by the way, when those two were here? That was 46 years ago, a long time ago, Wendy. Yeah, a long time ago. Um, and today, um, I love the fact that Paul suggested to us that we talk about home. And I'm going to talk about, not home specifically, but about the transition to a new home. Or another word for it is called moving. And I know that moving is a four-letter word for many of us, right? Moving is not easy. Moving is hard. Uh, moving oftentimes means the physical challenge of moving and also then the stress of finding new doctors and dentists, finding a church, making all kinds of adjustments to a community. So we'll talk a little bit about moving and the experience that it is, but we also know that moving brings with it blessings, the blessings of new vistas, and that God invites us in our moving to discover new things, to learn new things, and to be challenged in new ways. At least that's my experience. And Today, perhaps you'll want to think a little bit about your experience in moving, and I'll just share some of my experiences and reflect a little bit on them. And I want to talk about three moves in particular. Uh, the first was the move to the desert, and then the second was the move to Nashville, and the third was the move into retirement and into the borderlands area. So first, the move to the desert. Donna and I had been living in San Diego, as I said, and we grew up in the upper Midwest. I'm from South Dakota originally, she's from Iowa. Whenever we would go back to the Midwest, we would generally fly or drive through Las Vegas. We had never been to Arizona before, before the bishop's appointment. When we started driving out from San Diego, from Pacific Beach, in Donna's 1970 Chevelle Supersport, I married her because of her car. It was a hot rod, and I loved having a hot rod for the first time in my life. So uh, we got to the agricultural checkpoint at Yuma, and it was about nine o'clock at night. We decided we'd drive to the desert in the, in the cool of the evening, and we still had a couple of hours to go, but at the checkpoint, the car overheated. So what that meant is we all had to make a, a, a stop in Yuma that we had not intended. And fortunately, there was a, a garage that was open and we took the car there and there was right next to it, there was a hotel that still had vacancies and it said it was air conditioning. So we dropped the car off, we walked over to the hotel and of course, when they said air conditioning, what that meant is that they had window air conditioning units that had not been turned on. So when we walked into the room, it was 110 degrees in the room. And we were thinking to ourselves, what have we gotten ourselves into in this desert experience? Moving into the desert from another place is a pretty challenging thing. But we began to realize as we continued to live here and appreciate new things. Now, the scriptures that we had today are, to me, really fascinating. 
The first one is way back in the time of Moses when Moses is leading the people through the wilderness. And where is God? Well, God is in the tent. They made a tent and there is the Ark of the Covenant, an altar to God. And Moses would go there to be with God. So we have a migrant God, a God that, that went with Moses and went with the people of Israel through the wilderness. So this notion of a, a God who is with us throughout the journey in life is a really important way of understanding God. God is not just in a stationary in one particular place or in a church or sanctuary, but God is with us. So I love that image of the, of the tent of meeting Moses going to the tent and being with God. And the second scripture that we read is about Jesus and his saying, foxes have their holes, birds of the air have their nest, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So we're talking about a homeless Jesus, a migrant God and a homeless Jesus. Two really powerful and different images maybe of thinking about God. And as I think of the transitions that we make in life, sometimes that's helpful for me to realize God isn't where I came from. God isn't in any particular place, but it's this journey, this journey that we're on, that God is with us. And even the people who are lost and moving and feeling alone and feeling homeless, God is with them. So this move into the desert was that first really powerful experience for me of sensing wilderness, of sensing lostness, of sensing that, yes, I need to trust God, learn more from God. And that invitation, I think, comes with every move. The invitation to be humble and to draw more on our spiritual energy and our, on our relationship with God throughout that. There are times of, of spiritual growth when we move. So that first beginning was a shock as we realized that our car needed to be repaired and we needed to be on our way. We finally made it into Scottsdale United Methodist Church. I presented in the morning. I introduced myself in the morning. I had a heavy jacket on because all of my clothes were winter and, you know, beach clothes. So corduroys and uh, all the rest. Uh, it was very warm and that adjustment period for us. So what do we learn from the desert? What did God have to teach us in the desert? First of all, uh, a sense of, of the amazing capacity that we as human beings to be adaptive, to adapt to situations and surroundings, to environments. And we draw on that strength, that ability that God gives us to be creative and to solve problems and to talk with others and to find ways of making things work. Think about the desert people. Think about the Bedouin. Think about the people who spend their whole lives living out in the desert, like Moses and the people of Israel did. So people are really resilient. They have this capacity to endure amazing things. And God has given us that gift. But the second thing for me was gradually to get a sense of a different kind of aesthetic, a different understanding of beauty. You know, we're used to beauty in other environments as being very blatant, very explicit. And here's the desert. We have these subtle colors and these subtle transitions that take place. We were up um, in Hopi country and the painted desert and you think the painted desert, it's going to be very blatant. It's going to be like neon or something. And then you realize as the sun is going down and as the rays begin to change the colors along the painted desert, you see this incredible, rich, wonderful, but subtle pastels. And that's the desert. That's the desert. Um, and all throughout that sense of a different kind of aesthetic, a way of understanding things. 
So that's what we learned out of the desert. That's just a couple of pieces that we experienced, and maybe you can reflect on your own experience of what God has taught you in moving to the desert. But the second place where we moved was to Nashville, Tennessee. And this was a wonderful call, invitation to work with the upper room. I was just really excited about it. But we had never lived in the South before. We'd never even traveled in the South. Same kind of experience. So we arrive in the South, and the first thing is trying to understand people, understanding this language, Southern. And many of my good friends came to treat us that way and to understand that we needed some help sometimes. I remember I was at Subway getting a sandwich, and we'd been in Nashville by that time in about a couple of years. And behind me, there was a man who had a very strong Southern accent <clears throat> ordering his sandwich. And behind the counter at Subway was a man, a young man from India, who with his clipped British conversation was trying to understand the man from, from the South. And I ended up translating for the Southerner, and so that the man behind the counter was able to understand the order. And I thought, I've been here long enough now, I understand Southern, that's pretty good. That was a, a learning experience for me. But in the South, what I came to appreciate and learn, and what I think God was teaching me by living in that part of the world, is the importance of history. Not only history, for all of its pain and difficult things, the encounter with slavery, the encounter with racism in the South, but what stood out for me was this incredible courage of people to speak out and to initiate change. And of all the things that I want to lift up for just a moment is the incredible courage of women pastors in the United Methodist Church in the South. They are, they are in an environment that, if you think about what the Southern Baptist Convention just went through, deciding that women cannot be pastors, women who are pastors in the United Methodist Church are de facto heroes because of their willingness to stand in there with some very difficult circumstances. And then the work that is being done to address the issues of slavery and racism. So those were our first two moves. And the third move was the move to the borderlands and into retirement. Now coming off of uh, about a 40 year career in ministry, thinking that retirement would be an easy transition. And then the shock of understanding all of a sudden there's so much now I have to sort through who am I? When I'm playing golf, do I introduce myself as a pastor? Who will recognize me? Otherwise, we had immediate community when we came into a church and I was recognized as a pastor. So the struggle of identity, the whole issue of transition. Now, Green Valley, where we live, is a white retirement community. By white, I mean probably about 98%. <laughs> Largely white many of them coming from small Midwestern towns like we had come from. The location of Green Valley south of Tucson is interesting because to the north of us, south side Tucson is largely Hispanic. So there are about 300,000 Hispanics in south side Tucson. And to the south of us, 35 miles to the south is Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, Mexico, together about 400,000 people. So here we are, this white island in the middle of this brown sea, Hispanic on both the North and Mexican nationals on the South. And what I came to realize is the way in which people in this white retirement community would live within that community and they were fearful of moving beyond that community to connecting with their neighbors. I went on a cross-border tour with Border Community Alliance, organization that I work with, a nonprofit, and it blew my mind. It changed so much of my thinking. 
and I realized how much I needed to know about my neighbors. Now, we had lived in Scottsdale, we had lived in Casa Grande, we had lived in Tucson, and I had been to Mexico a few times, but I knew very little about Mexico. And I came to realize that a lot of people in my situation have the same very, very limited understanding. And most of the time that ends up being stereotypes. So we ended up uh, with this Border Community Alliance developing programs around building and bridging through education, cross-cultural exchange, and social investment relationships with Mexican leaders of nonprofits and churches and working to try to help people change their perception and relate to their neighbors. And what I came to in terms of an understanding of home is this, that home is not just about getting yourself comfortable in your own environment, but it's also about building relationships with neighbors. And if we don't know our neighbors and we don't know our communities, if we surround ourselves with fear of others who are other than us, whose cultures are different, whose understanding is different, then we do not have a home. And my uh, secret goal is this. Uh, in Green Valley and probably in lots of places here, we will say, where are you from? And somebody will say, well, I'm from Tempe, or I'm from Tucson, or I'm from Green Valley. And then you'll say, well, where are you really from? And then people will talk about what they identify as home. So we have people who lived for 30 years in Green Valley who still said, well, I'm going to go home. And by home, they meant that small town in the Midwest. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could help them to get a sense that this is home and to break down those barriers. So over the last 10 years, I've led, co-led classes on Mexican history. We've led about 100 tours, groups to, to go into Mexico to do what we call kind of a come and see. Come and see, meet your neighbors and get to understand them. Finding out how People I didn't know a lot of things about Mexico, including, for example, Mexico's gross national product is about number 15 in the world. How many of us think of Mexico in those terms as one of the top 50 countries in the world economically? Mexican nationals come into the U.S. and in Arizona spend about $3 billion a year. In Tucson, Mexican nationals, Mexican shoppers are essential for the retail markets. And in South, South Tucson, South on the, there's two large retail shopping centers that cater specifically to Mexican nationals. Breaking down these barriers, understanding that this pulse is there for all of us, and going back in history and realizing that this part of Arizona, particularly what we call Baja, Arizona, southern Arizona below the Gila River was the last part of, to be added into the United States with the Gadsden Purchase in 1854. And realizing that the border is something that's meant, should not be a barrier, but a place of discovery and a place of learning about each other. We have a program of social investment where we take with our tours, we take people to nonprofits, to migrant shelters, to wheelchair factories, to geriatric centers, to orphanages, led by Mexican nationals. And we invite people to find out what Mexicans are doing about their own country. I had never asked the question, what do Mexicans think about all of this? Mind-blowing experience for me, and I just believe that that importance of creating a home, building relationships with our neighbor. And it's still going on for me. Our latest venture has been to work with the Tohono O'odham Reservation. And Tohono O'odham, of course, inhabited this whole world 
And if you haven't been to the Huhugam Cultural Center in Chandler, which opened in March of 2020 and closed in March of 2020 because of the pandemic, if you get a chance to go there, I really encourage you to do it. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful cultural center. And Stacia, I'll give you the address for that afterwards. So I'm here to invite you to face the challenge of what it means to make a home and to explore and to develop your own capacity to reach out to those neighbors, the people that we are all around us, and also then to know that this is our home, that God is with us in every transition. God is the migrant God who's with us in every place that we are. Thanks be to God. Amen.